So, uh, you were a scout pilot in Vietnam. I was a U.S. Army warrant officer scout pilot. Okay. Bravo Troop, 1st of the 9th Squadron, 1st Air Cav Division. In 1968, for seven months, up in the I-Corps region, working out of a base called Camp Evans. Yeah. How is to be on a scout pilot? Our job, our job, our job as pilot, all pilots in Vietnam, was to protect that grunt on the ground. Mm -hmm. That grunt on the ground, the soldiers down there walking around in the mud in their rice paddies, was our primary concern. Mm -hmm. We did everything we could. So, the best thing, the best thing we could give them. so your work was to protect the soldiers in the ground. Yeah, we were there to take care of the soldiers on the ground. Okay, and how was your scout, your scout helicopter? It had a minigun or a door gunner or? We flew the, uh, the aircraft made by Hughes Aircraft Company out of Culver City. Of California. It was called the Army designation was the Hughes OH 6A. Mm -hmm. It was called the Cayuse, K A Y U S. The Cayuse. After, after an American uh, tribal Indian, uh, Indian tribal mm -hmm. tribe. And uh, it was uh, called, uh, lovingly nicknamed the Loach, mm -hmm. which stands for Light Observation Helicopter, basically, and that's the way you pronounce it, Loach. And um, we flew, in my unit, we flew with the pilot, me, in the right front seat, in the left front seat. He was usually equipped with a M16 automatic rifle with a 100-round drum. Mm -hmm. And in the right rear, we had a door gunner who was equipped with an M60 machine gun and an M79 grenade launcher. And all kinds of loose grenades and explosives you could throw out the door. Okay. Our job, our job was primarily to find the enemy, fix him, mark his location, and get out of the way and let our attack helicopters all the way up to B-52 strikes kill them. Mm -hmm. We were what was called a hunter-killer team. And our job was to search and destroy. We were to search out the enemy and destroy him when we found him. Okay. Um, I heard this like uh, so many times about scout, scout pilots. It's really that you just take AK fire? So no, when, I was, when I was there, our primary problem from ground fire was what we call small arms fire. Mm -hmm. And that was everything from the SKS rifle to the AK-47 semi and full automatic submachine guns and then various other higher caliber machine guns that fired 30 caliber and 8 caliber and 8 millimeter projectiles oh, us. Now when we when we went into heavily fortified areas we encountered the Chinese communist 51 caliber machine gun. Oh, that God. Was pretty much, pretty much like our 50 cal, our 50 caliber rounding machine gun. But they, theirs was a 51 caliber, and ours was a 50 caliber. They did it that way so that when we captured their ammunition, we couldn't fire it in our weapons, but when they captured ours, they could fire it in their weapons. Get that? Yes. So, uh, like in the Alcal Valley, I went in there six times into the Alcal Valley. It was a heavily fortified valley. And we also got shot at by tracked any aircraft vehicle with multiple guns on them, usually four guns of different calibers designed to shoot down aircraft. We also encountered uh, 37 millimeter radar operated cannon that were designed to shoot us down and did shoot a lot of us down. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, mostly it was small arms fire, everything but AK 47s, all the way up to the 37 millimeter anti aircraft guns. So, uh, I see here that you have 35 air medals and two bronze stars. How do you get it? Well, the air medals, 
uh, I, I don't really know how many I have. Uh, I know that I have 35 plus. Okay. And you get one air medal for every 25 hours of combat flight. Mm -hmm. So every 25 hours, I got one air medal. Okay. And a total of over 35. And the Bronze Stars? That was 900 plus hours of combat flying. Mm. So. 900, 900 plus hours of combat flying. And seven months. Seven months? Oh my God. Seven months. I was shot down eight times. You were shot that's down eight times? My, yeah, that's how I earned my nickname over there. I was given the nickname Cat. No, Cato. <laughs> so, who oh, do you get? Eight, eight times. You get nine lives, cat has nine lives. So, how do you remember getting shut down? What What was like getting shut down? Well, I just, uh, uh, I was very fortunate. I, I never, I would never was afraid. Uh, I was, my first two missions in Vietnam, I got shot down. First and second time, I got shot down. And my, after the second time, I was never afraid again. I just, you know, you couldn't worry about it. If you thought about it, you'd go crazy. You know, you just couldn't think about it. So you just put it out of your mind. We played the old game of what's called, when your number's up, your number's up, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. So we just went and did our job, and we did as best we could. So when we were getting shot at, we didn't really think about it too much, because we were too busy trying to do the right thing and get out of trouble. And being in control, especially as a pilot, the one and only pilot. I realized all the other on the aircraft always had two pilots, but the only six eight loads, as we called it, only had one pilot. That was me. So uh, I was responsible for the aircraft and the crew and everything. I had too much to do to worry about being shot at. <laughs> and how do you get uh, got in the army? You got drafted, or you were a volunteer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was. Uh, no, I was in college. I was in the College of Architecture, University of Houston in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. I had a, a 3.8 grade point average. I didn't have to worry about the draft. I was safe in college. I had good grades. And, um, but I felt guilty. Every time I turned on the radio or the TV or picked up a newspaper mm -hmm. or a magazine, all I read about was how many of our guys got killed that day. And I felt guilty. Now, I, did, I knew I didn't want to be a ground, on the ground. My stepfather was a career Army artillery officer. He was a full colonel when he died at age 62. And uh, just from talking to him and watching all the war movies and stuff, I knew I didn't want to be on the ground and I wanted to fly. And I didn't have a degree yet, a, a college degree, so I couldn't fly in the Marines, with the Navy, or the Air Force because they required a degree before you could go to flight school. So the Army was the only opportunity I had. At the time, they had a program called the Army Warrant Officer Flight Program, and all you needed was a high school diploma. So I qualified for that, took the test, went through two months of basic training, and two months I was in flight school. <laughs> and do you ever, like, uh, had PTSD? Because I have a cousin um, the, in the army, and he had he has PTSD. Do you ever had PTSD or something like that? Oh yeah, I got PTSD big time. Dude. I uh, uh, I can't I can't believe I, I can't describe to you what it was like because was yes, I know he's the infantry guys, the grunts. Uh, they might have seen action two or three times a month. But in the aviation units, we were in the thick of it every single day, day after day. Every morning we took off, we never know if we were coming home that night. And uh, I can't tell you <laughs> all the blood and gore I've witnessed. Mm -hmm. But killed them and they killed us, and by God, it was it was it was fucking awful. Pardon my French, but it was it was horrible. Yes, I know. Being uh, being in the war is horrible. I know, I know. Every day we were out there fighting them. Every day. But um, if you had the opportunity, to the opportunity to go back in the sixties. 
you will join again the army or well it's uh it's it's funny to add that because only recently in the past few years that our fellow americans mm -hmm. started thanking us for our service over there this is a question that and, uh, every every time every time somebody thanks me for my service i tell them you know i would do it again i'm just waiting for the phone call but at 74 years of age i don't think it's coming Mm -hmm. But I would do it again, yes sir. And this is a question that I, that I asked to my cousin. What do you think about the veterans that uh, suicide? I'll say it again, please. What do you think about the veterans that commit suicide? That they just said, I don't want to live, and they just uh, die. They just want to die. What do you think about that veterans? Well... In my opinion, first of all, you've got to know that for every guy that's in combat, there's six or seven support people behind him that never see combat. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's only a small percentage of those people that are over there that were actually ever in combat. Mm -hmm. The majority of the people in Vietnam never saw combat. Now, that's not to say they were never in danger, mm -hmm. because they were. Because they would get murdered, they would get rocketed, they would get, uh, uh, the enemy would try to overrun their positions, things like that. But six out of seven of every military person in Vietnam was in a support role to support that one person in the field that was actually in combat. Mm -hmm. So the majority of these guys that come back from Vietnam never saw combat. All this small percentage. And it's those small percentage of guys that are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. They, uh, we have demons <laughs> that visit us. And this is a question. Fact, continue, continue. These demons never, these demons never were as long. It was, it was night. Now, when you start getting older, and you're not busy trying to raise a family and working and making meat and, you know, pay this guy, pay this guy. You know, you're out there working and you're always occupied. When you retire, all that goes away and you have nothing but time on your hands. And um, this is a question and I everybody, wanted to... Everybody, everybody goes straight back to Vietnam, the experience they had there, and that's all that's on their minds. And it drives them crazy. Mm -hmm. No, this is a question I wanted to ask um, as cow pilot. In the Netflix documentary, The Vietnam War, there is a scout pilot named Ron Faritzi, I think it's pronounced like that. He said that being a scout pilot is like being a duck, a decoy. Do you agree with, agree with him or do you have a different opinion? Well, now, I've, I've read these stories about these guys that thought our job as scout pilots was to go out there and to hang out and let them shoot at us. In other words, be bait or decoy, as you say. But that's, that's not correct. Uh, any, any scout pilot in his right mind would never think that. He would never intentionally put himself out there to get, be shot at as a normal tactical uh, method. The only time that that would occur is when you have families that are pinned down or, and they need to get to safety. Mm -hmm. And you have to draw fire from the enemy to give them time to get to safety. Mm -hmm. Or situations like that. That was something you did only when you absolutely had to. It was not a daily practice. And then the scout pilot that tells you that is a got empire. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, any scout pilot that will tell you that he was out there to decoy I doubt that he was a scout pilot to begin with. One thing you're going to find out, Emilio, is that online and everywhere you turn, there are all kinds of what we call wannabes. They want to be this and they want to be that. And they'll tell you stuff that they swear by and it's a damn lie because it mm -hmm. never happens. Mm -hmm. The wannabes are everywhere and they want to be something they're not. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because now it's popular to be a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And those people out there have found to steal our glory. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
In other words, uh, well, thanks for the interview, Cliff. There, there, is, there, is a, there is a term for this, and it's called stolen power. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 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 they're everywhere. Believe me, I am. Ah, the stolen baller. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So. so scout pilots do not. Scout pilots is a normal, uh, uh, tactical tactic, but never go out and make this said decoys on a day in and day out basis. That's just absolutely insane. You understand? Yes. That yes. is insane. Mm -hmm. Nobody would do that. Mm -hmm. So, Cliff. Thanks for the interview. Thanks for your service. Uh, this is a really good information for me because I always wanted to talk to a scout pilot. And very thanks. Thanks for the interview.